Hello, I'm Michelle Yanachan, and this is Fast Tracks Insider Guide with my top travel tips from around the world. In Russia, the Marinsky Theatre is opening a second stage in St. Petersburg. The 2000 seat Marinsky II will become one of the largest performing arts complexes in Europe, complete with a rooftop amphitheatre looking over the city. The gala opening weekend will include Russian soprano Anna Netrebko, Placido Domingo, as well as the Marinsky Academy of Young Singers and students from the Vaganova Academy of Russian Ballet. Now is the green season in Costa Rica, marking the start of the country's rainiest months. However, showers are usually confined to the afternoons, and the upside is there are fewer crowds, making it a good time to visit. Wildlife's more accessible here than in some other Central American nations, and the country also boasts excellent guides. Look out for howler monkeys, scarlet macaws and toucans, as well as clouds of butterflies. The Macau International Dragon Boat Festival is in June on the 8th, 9th and 12th on Nam Van Lake. This year's festivals in Macau are bigger and better than ever as the territory marks its 500th anniversary since the arrival of the Portuguese. In the north of Chile, ALMA has launched the world's largest astronomical project which is scouring the deepest parts of the universe. The site's planning to open to public visits. Watch this space for more news on that. And in the meantime, try one of the other observatories in Chile, like Paranal, Tololo, or Mamayuca. The last weekend in May is the Indianapolis 500 mile race, or Indy 500, in the USA. Hundreds of thousands of spectators converge at the track to watch the drivers do 200 laps or a distance of 500 miles. In the UK, the Hay Festival begins May 23rd, a Woodstock of the mind, as former US President Bill Clinton called it. Here, the audience gets to meet international writers and thinkers, historians and novelists, philosophers and poets. And after dark, it's the turn of comedians and musicians. There are also Sister Hay Festivals year-round, from Cartagena to Dakar, Beirut to Nairobi. In Switzerland, the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Museum reopens May 18th, bigger and with a new permanent exhibition, The Humanitarian Adventure. New themes at the museum include the defense of human dignity and restoring family links. And finally, if you're in Beijing on May 28th, the flag drops on the Peking to Paris Motor Challenge up at the Great Wall. I'll be in car 38, a 1940 Ford coupe called China, trying to get ahead of the pack in this epic race. 12,247 kilometers over 33 days from the Chinese to the French capital. Thanks for checking in with my Insider Guide this month. Until next time, happy traveling. Thanks, Michelle. Now to end this week, we're off to the Belgian frontier in northern France, a region which saw some of the bloodiest fighting in the First World War. But these days, it's an area also well known in cycling circles for a grueling race from Paris to Roubaix, which has been dubbed the Hell of the North. We've decided to follow a bunch of intrepid British amateur cyclists as they cross the channel, take on the local terrain and try desperately to reach the finish line of the race, which takes place every year. Let's just hope they've trained hard enough. I'm part of the London Baradeur cycle team. Baradeur means to do battle in French. Throughout the winter, we've been training hard to tackle one of Europe's most gruelling rides, following in the tire tracks of the pros.
And that's where I'm going to now with these guys, to northern France for the Paris-Roubaix Challenge. It's the toughest cycling event in the calendar year. I've been longing to do this for as long as I can remember. I can't believe I'm actually going to do it now. Europe's champion pedal pushers start off from Paris for Roubaix in one of the oldest, most famous and most grueling of the continent's bicycle races. First held in 1896, Paris-Roubaix is one of the oldest cycle races in the world. The race got its nickname, the Hell of the North, because of the terrible churned up ground left behind here after the First World War. In a brutal battle of physical and mental endurance, riders pit their wits and their wheels against 27 sections of bone-shaking pave, or cobblestones. But how would my team fare in today's cycle challenge? Over 2,000 riders are taking part in the 170 kilometer ride and the nerves are beginning to show. Not sleeping, that's, that's the worst. I'm pretty good, nervous but I'm good. Just want to get going now. Since it's a staggered start, there are just a few gendarmes to wish us luck as we set off. Yes. 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 We soon get into our stride. But we know this is the calm before the storm. As soon as we hit the first section of Pave, everything's going to go crazy. It'll be noise and bottles will be flying off. It's like sitting on a pneumatic drill, the bike's jumping about all over underneath you. You're aware of, of crashes and bits of bike falling off and all kinds of craziness. It, it, it goes through your head that this shouldn't be allowed, it shouldn't be, I shouldn't, shouldn't be allowed to ride on this surface. But for just one day a year, we are allowed. I've been told the knack of riding over the cobbles is to rest your hands lightly on top of the handlebars and pedal like crazy. That way, you're supposed to glide over the cobbles. <laughs> I'll burn about two and a half thousand calories in today's ride, so I take every chance to refuel. We went on a lot of cobbles, about three sections so far. The first one was okay. I knew what to expect. I got cheers from friends out there. Uh, the third one was crazy because we were going down, slightly downhill and my hands started burning up. There's people coming out and waving for me, so it's a lot, of, uh, a lot of support, so it's a good thing. On the road again, and we seem to be making good time. But just 20 kilometers in, and disaster strikes. It's a beast of a puncture and it takes us four inner tubes to fix, costing us valuable time. But the puncture is nothing compared to what lies ahead. The famous forest of Arenberg, 2.4 kilometers of cobbled hell. This section of Pave dates back to Napoleonic times and is so rugged, it's only open one day a year to idiots like us. Bruised, battered, but feeling somewhat heroic, I come out the other side. I'm just glad to have survived. I can't tell you how proud I am to enter the legendary Roubaix Velodrome to do our lap of honor. Our time? A bum-numbing eight hours and six minutes. It was pain, it was parve, it was pleasure, it really hurt. I fell, I crashed in the grass. <laughs> I can't believe I'm here. I've watched this seven years in a row in a restaurant in Clapham, French restaurant in Clapham, and I'm here. I can't believe it, I'm so happy. And the rest of the team are just as jubilant. We said we'd never do it again, but we're already contemplating entering next year's challenge. 
The Paris to Roubaix cycle race, definitely not for the faint hearted. And that's it for this week. Do try and join us again next week, though, when Keith Wallace will be taking a look at the rip off rates some hotels charge for accessing Wi Fi in your room, often when it's available for free at the coffee shop next door. Only this year, London's Ritz dropped its massive $37 a night Wi Fi charge for guests. And as Tourism Australia tries to encourage hotels there to stop charging us for wireless, I'll be looking into whether, in this day and age, we should expect wireless internet for free. Because social media is really part of today's world and it's part of travel. It's inexorably linked to how people travel. They travel with devices, they want to tell stories about their places that they go and this matters to them. This is a way of recording their, that, those data. Even with airlines, you have to online check in the day before. So if you're sending one of your guests to a different location, to use Wi-Fi or you're telling them to pay for that Wi-Fi, I just think it creates a slight friction between you and the customer, which I don't think is worthwhile. I'll be testing some of the tech that might help you beat some of the more unscrupulous fees. The, the data coming down was really fast mm. and the upload speeds were very fast. All those kind of technical things were, yeah. were excellent. Join us next week on Fast Track to find out whether wireless internet should be regarded like hot water and fluffy towels as an absolute basic. It looks like a goodie, so do join us for that if you can. In the meantime, do check us out online for some more tips, news and inspiration by logging on to the addresses shown on your screen now. But until then, from me, Fiona Foster and the rest of the Fast Track team, wherever your travels take you next, do have a great time. Bye-bye.